Welcome to the United Nations Association of the USA's webinar on a response to racism and social justice. 75 years ago, the founding document of the United Nations proclaimed in its preamble, quote, we the peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women. Three years later, leaders from throughout the world proclaimed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that the recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world, that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, that no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, that all are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. In these past weeks, we as a society have been in a turbulent tide that has tested the very foundation of not only our nation, but of the body of nations of the human race. The witnessing of and protesting against racism in all of its forms, police brutality, social violence, racial violence, inequalities in medical care, economic opportunities, education, have become the screams of horror and disbelief and the demands of the people that Black Lives Matter, the demands for change. So we have gathered now to bond in strength across this nation, to share the vision and the voices, to share our tests and our testimonies. Still ringing in our ears and hearts are the haunting words, quote, I can't breathe. Still pounding the highways and byways are the yells of Black Lives Matter. Still emboldened in our recent and collective memory are the images of the thousands of Black men and women who have been hanged and murdered in this nation, not just this month, but over 400 years. Michelle Bachelet, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, called out structural racism in the US and stated, quote, the voices calling for an end to the killings of unarmed African Americans need to be heard. The voices calling for an end to police violence need to be heard. And the voices calling for an end to the endemic and structural racism that blights US society need to be heard. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said, the fight against racism is at the core of the United Nations work we must move forward with introspection, honesty, and action. We at UNAUSA have already begun our actions. The UNAUSA has signed on to the letter to the UN Human Rights Council by the Floyd family and 600 organizations to hold a UN special session on police violence and repression of protests in the United States. Our members have held town hall meetings written op-ed articles, marched in the streets of our cities, advocated for policy change, worked on voter registration, and been at the forefront in social justice efforts. Our chapters have raised their voices in statements of protest, condemnation, and demand for change. Our members are invoking the power and promise of the Sustainable Development Goals, most pointedly of reducing and eradicating inequalities, goal number 10, and ensuring peace, justice, and strong institutions, goal number 16. Today, we have called for this dialogue. Some of you may remember when we held national dialogues on race in the late 90s. Today, a generation later, we again make the call. However, not so much to focus on a panel discussion, but to get to the point of sharing our personal perspectives and experiences, our stories. For it is through such laying bare the raw reality of what is that we can move forward and take action. We will begin with our special guests who will present brief statements based upon their expertise and personal experience, then move on to an open discussion to give you an opportunity to respond to three key questions. 
To begin, each of our panelists will respond to the following two prompts. One, can you share any experiences with racism, how they help to define you or motivate you? And two, with the current events, what specific suggestions do you have for the audience to ensure that this moment focused on Black Lives Matter becomes a true movement that will support sustainable to goal number 10 in our country? And for you, if you'd like to learn more about each of our speakers, their bios have been linked to the chat box. So first, we will hear from Slam Poem, presented by Nikki Patton, a community activist, author, and Peabody Award-winning poet, who has appeared on HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam, and also presented at the UN in Geneva to testify on behalf of Black women and girls. Nikki? I am muted. Let me start again. Thank you, Tessa, for that beautiful introduction and for your opening remarks. Can everybody hear me? Are we good? Yeah? Okay, great. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcome. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. Audre Lord. When it is the police, we remain silent. When it is rape, we remain silent. When it is someone famous, someone powerful, someone popular, we remain silent. Of all rape victims, we have the right to require silence because we think no one is innocent, not even the innocent, not ever the victim. We make them complicit. We are told when we are young who we can go to to feel safe. Tell the police. Tell your teacher. Tell your preacher. What do you tell when those charged with your protection, those tasks, to give you service, slide their badges over your body, shove their chalk down your throat, get you drunk on the blood of Jesus and tell you that your silence will protect you. The numbers tell me that nothing will protect me or you. Like since 1976, 1,479 people have been executed on death row. And I first, I want to note, wrote this piece in 2014. Back then the line read, but over 14,000 have been murdered by police. I've had to update it to over 19,000 murdered by police. Like how sexual misconduct is the second highest form of police brutality. Like how you're more likely to get raped by a cop than someone on the street. Like how Oklahoma City cop Daniel Holtzclaw can face over 32 charges of first degree rape, forcible sodomy, and sexual battery and still get freed on bail and still get thousands in donations because him getting punished for raping black women is seen as the real injustice. Like how 51% of all sexual violence committed by police is against minors. Like how 60% of black women will be raped before they turn 18. Like how every woman I know has either been raped or her sister or her mama or her daughter or her friend or her coworker or her cousin or her classmate has been raped. Like how men get raped, but no one ever wants to talk, at that, talk about that because we don't even like to talk about women getting raped. Like how trans folks and gender nonconforming folks get raped but we don't like to talk about that because we don't even like to talk about their existence, like how children get raped, but no one ever wants to talk about, talk about that because we don't ever want to talk about anyone getting raped, like how sex is the weapon when it comes to rape, not the actual point, because rape has hardly ever come and hardly ever close to justice with thousands of rape kits languishing in basements of police stations nationwide. Why am I talking about rape when I'm supposed to be talking about how we can't breathe? This PTSD takes my breath away takes my days, turns them into tears, takes my joys, turns them into terrors, takes and takes and takes my life until I swallow darkness of silence to keep the kind of sanity that makes everyone else more comfortable than I will ever be. I have never been able to breathe. I hold my stomach in unintentionally, have held it in for decades, trying to hold myself together, held it in so long that it hurts to pee, to sing, to sleep, to speak. Everyone tells me that my silence will protect me just like the police are supposed to protect me, just like the church should be my sanctuary, just like tools and workshops and poetry were supposed to liberate me, but I still can't breathe because the movement ain't trying to get me free when rape is so pervasive that those trying to uplift the masses do their best to try to uplift some <laughs> and press fingers into screen saying, just move with me, not against me, saying, keep this our secret. No one will believe you anyway. Gluttons for power will always gorge themselves on those they perceive as weak. What is most terrifying to the powerful is the weak 
realizing their strength. There is no keeping of secrets when the raped find their justice in the telling of what happened. There is no keeping of secrets when the dead are resurrected through the anger of the living. There is no keeping of the secret that the system of America was built between the thighs of captured dark women, built inside the grooves of bloodied black backs, built on top of bones red and feathered with colonizing cruelty when the desecrated begin to assess the damage. Demand what was stolen be returned. Demand what was broken be repaired. Demand what was destroyed be restored. Demand what was betrayed be reconciled by the awful fearing truth that the breath will demand its rightful place. The breath will command its right, rightful space to matter, to shatter this silence that will never protect us. We matter. Black lives matter. Black lives. Women, trans, lesbian, gay, gender non-conforming men, children raped, beaten, arrested, unprotected, exploited, protesting, poor, policed, and all in between Black lives matter. And so we must. Thank you for listening. Okay. Thank you so much, Nikki. Such a powerful voice. Uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Mrs. Ruth Hazel. Thompson, Special Advisor to Governor Andrew Cuomo for Policy and Community Affairs. And again, she'll address the two prompts that we've uh, posed to her. Ms. Hassel Thompson. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was prideful that I was not going to be following our poetess. Um, and I'm even more afraid now that I am. But I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be with you tonight. And um, the question of, of racism is so pervasive that we don't have enough time to be able to talk about all of the incidences that occur over the lifetime of a Black woman who aspires to public office before working for the governor for 25 years, I was an elected official on local and state government level. Um, and the racism became more subtle um, as we began to put policies in place um, that made overt racism a no-no. But of course, we can't legislate the hearts of people. The only thing that we can do in this movement is to create such a noise that we will drown out those who in some states still have two fifths of a person in their in their legislation that that just defines who we are as black people um so we will drown out those who think that the confederate flag and what it stood for is all right to wave on the capitals of our states around this country, which is a resurrection and a continuing remembrance of the power of white supremacy. Until we drown out those voices that say Black lives don't matter. This has been a very disturbing time as we have worked uh, through this pandemic and to have statistical information that we've all been somewhat aware of intellectually, but to have to internalize the fact that the numbers of those who have died in this country uh, from this pandemic have been from, from our um, low-income communities, from our communities of color, because we've been talking ever since we passed every state legislation that there has been a serious disparity in healthcare. There's been a serious disparity in education. There's been a serious um, disparity in wage. There's been a serious, I mean, going on and on and on. And each of these disparities um, plays into the fact that we are not able to get access to the appropriate type of care that is necessary so that the, so that those inherent uh, diseases and disorders that we have can be treated in their earliest stages 
my grandmother was one who just believed that you suffered through the pain uh, because going to the doctor and spending money for a doctor was not a priority, putting food on the table and other kinds of, of issues that should never have been an issue, the opportunities that she should have been afforded to get a better education, um, that her children should have been afforded to get a better education. The fact that they had to go into the military in order to supplement uh, their incomes. I mean, there are just so many issues and, and we're, at the, we're at the precipice of an opportunity to worldwide say, we've had enough, but that's not enough. It is not enough to say we've had enough, but it is important that we use this opportunity to not whine, but to wind up and stand up and bring up people with us who have been in the shadows, been our, been our allies, but have been afraid. Everybody has to come out into the light and say, enough is enough. It, yes. just, it cannot just be our young people. It cannot just be people of color, but it has to be those of us who really understand that it is not just an erosion of those who are the victims, but it is an erosion of everything that we ever pretended to believe that this country um, could be and the potentiality that it promised to be. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Hansel Thompson. I want um, Mr. Ambrose, Garvin Ambrose, who's Chief of Bureau of Administrative Services for Illinois' Cook County State's Attorney to join us here in this conversation. Garvin, uh, your reaction to the two prompts that uh, we're trying to focus around. No, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, before starting, I just want to uh, say out loud that my statements or my opinions today are my own. Uh, they do not reflect those of my office, the Cook County State Attorney's Office. Uh, like Ms. Hassel Thompson uh, referenced and Ms. Patton referenced as well. Uh, for me, it goes back, uh, my truth goes back 34 years. Um, 34 years uh, when I moved from Dominica, an island in the Caribbean, to Toronto, Canada, uh, where for the first time I saw some people who didn't look like me. For the first time, I was the minority um, growing up in an island where 99% of the people look like you. You start facing those issues in Toronto where uh, racism first starts. Well, we moved into an Italian neighborhood, and at that point, um, the term that I remember 34 years later is uh, castagna bruciata, meaning burned chestnut. And burned chestnut is what I was called uh, growing up in that neighborhood. Um, there were very few of me who had to protect each other. My brother and myself had to protect each other and fought through certain issues. And those suppression of the anger, that rage, um, the feeling of revenge, um, trying to lash out, you have to suppress some of those things. Um, suppression that continues throughout a lifetime 34 years later, where uh, growing up, moving through high school, and playing sports and experiencing issues where uh, you go into one jurisdiction and individuals are dressed in KKK outfits uh, in the audience while you are playing a sport and turning around and seeing that and wanting to react, but knowing that, again, you must suppress and suppress that anger because but for your school is going to be blackballed, um, but for you end up losing and becoming the angry black man that people want you to be or expect you to be. Um, and that's something that my parents have always taught me is never show that type of frustration because the, what motivates you is that anger. Uh, what motivates you is the family that you have behind knowing that you have somebody that you have to look up to. You have somebody that is coming behind you and making sure that the spaces that you enter um, are not just for you alone, but for those that, you're, that are behind you. Uh, so that's why you suppress some of those feelings of lashing out, suppressing some of those issues in the room um, that once you actually get into that space, you need to realize that, um, unfortunately, the motivation is also uh, knowing that the generation of folks before you who have fought, um, Ms. Hassel Thompson referenced, 25 years in state le and local legislature, putting policies forward to help bring a generation up. 
to help make life better for individuals like myself and hopefully do the same for those individuals, those young people we see in the streets who are protesting peacefully, those who are looting and rioting, those individuals who understand that in a society where things are not equal or there's no equity, that they have to come up at some level, that those um, policies that we need to put forth, uh, policies that I implore everyone as part of the second question that you're asked, what, what can we do? Uh, not just read, not just say, I'm sorry, not just uh, look at some of the books that are out there, but actually be active, be um, not just allies, but accomplices of sorts. And um, I say accomplices because my wife and I did a town hall the other day, and that term came up where an accomplice actually is, is with you the entire time. And allies can come and go, but an accomplice is in it to, in it to win it, in it to the end. And uh, in the law enforcement field, we end up seeing that accomplices end up being punished as much as uh, the perpetrator. And in this field, knowing that black folks, African-Americans can't do it alone. We've tried to do it alone. Um, Tulsa burned down after we tried to uh, build our black banks and our black Wall Street of sorts. And we have to end up moving forward. Uh, one of the things that we end up looking at is the uh, as part of that racism that I end up suppressing is a self-identity. At some point, we start to suppress that identity and making sure that um, that good black person that um, we are supposed to be or expected to be end up showing up, but for losing that space that we've created. Um, so one of the things that I do want to mention is that the authenticity that we bring as black individuals into the spaces that we create or that were created for us, uh, making sure that we are bringing that authentic nature. Uh, this issue of George Floyd, Tamir Rice, um, Breonna, Breonna Taylor, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, any of those names, it's not just about that. This is, not, this is a catalyst. Um, and I think it's now where you're seeing individuals who, a lot, allies and accomplices who are now seeing someone dying on the street. The same thing we've been telling them for years and preaching for years and they've kind of suppressed themselves are now seeing it firsthand and now outraged firsthand and now want to come on and we invite them to come on to help move the dialogue further. Um, so this is not just about those individuals but it's about finally that suppressed anger, rage and violence now coming to the forefront and spilling over. Great. Thank you so much, Garvin, and I think you, you've made some very good points that I'm hoping that our listeners and our participants tonight will, will respond to also. Our next uh, speaker is Attorney London Bell, who is an international human rights law and policy advocate, and she's also a member of our UNA UNA National Council. Uh, Attorney Bell, London. Thank you, Tita. Um, hello, everyone. Good evening. And uh, what I want to do is I want to tell you all a little story, just a quick story. And, and how I feel about it. So uh, back in 2003, on a warm summer night, this is a story about a young black man on my block. Back in 2003, on a warm summer night on my block in Detroit, a young black man was three doors down from his house visiting a friend and playing a spirited game of basketball. Once the game ended, he bid his friend good night and he began to walk home, three doors down. As he walked, he noticed kids playing in the street and told them to get out of the street because a car was coming. Uh, it was a police car. But as soon as the police advanced down the street, it slowed down and stopped near him. Two white female officers got out of the car and signaled for him to stop and come to them. When he stopped, he asked why they were stopping him. And one of the officers told them they needed to see his ID. The young man asked, well, why? The officer repeated herself. At that time, the young man refused to show his ID and asserted his right to refuse this command because he had not given them probable cause to stop him. Also, he also explained that he was literally three doors down from his house and on his way home. Now the officers are like irritated that this young man has refused their demand of his ID and one officer approached him and commanded him to lean against their car. She had his arms pinned to the back and was just about to handcuff him Meanwhile, one of the children playing outside ran to the man's house to get his mother. His mother comes to the porch and she can see everything unfolding. So she runs down, she runs down to find out more. 
And by this time, the young man and the officers are in a heated verbal exchange while the young man is about to be handcuffed. Wait, his mother says, what is going on? What are you doing? Do you know who he is? Well, ma'am, we wouldn't know who he is if he had given us his ID. When we ordered him to, he resisted and now he is being detained. Again, the young man asserted his right because the officer simply did not have a reason to stop him in the first place. Finally, the man's mother told the officers who he was, and the officers immediately apologized and released him. Both he and his mom walked those three doors down home. The young man was upset, but eventually he let it go. The house that they walked to was my house. The woman that ran from her porch to find out why her son was about to be handcuffed was my mom. And that young man who asserted his rights to the officers was my brother, Vincent. It was July 2003, and Lance Corporal Vincent James Bell of the U.S. Marine Corps had just gotten back from his first tour of duty in Iraq. He was on leave and visiting his mom and sisters in Detroit. He was racially profiled until his mother intervened and told the officers who he was. It was then that they let him go. Now, most people would think, well, why didn't he just give him give them their, his ID. Well, he knew his rights. He knew the Constitution, and he had taken an oath to protect it. Years later, as staff sergeant, uh, years later in four additional deployments, Vincent was killed in action and in, in fighting the Taliban in Afghanistan. He stepped on an IED. Once he realized what happened, he instructed his Marines to run and stand back. This way, he was able to pre prevent the loss of any of his Marines. He was the only service member to die that day, on November 30th, 2011, along with injuries sustained by two Afghan soldiers. He was 28. Our family had Vincent laid to rest in Section 60 at Arlington National Cemetery. These are hollow grounds guarded by the Army's 3rd Infantry. But on those same grounds, not too far away from where Vincent is buried, sits Robert E. Lee's home and slave quarters, slave quarters that are still standing. And this is hallowed ground where the final resting place of Justice Thurgood Marshall, Medgar Evers, uh, Black general service members from every American war, astronauts, freed slaves, uh, they're all laid to rest on the grounds where enslaved Africans worked the land for free. My brother, a Black man, an American hero, rests at the most prestigious burial, prestigious burial site in the United States on the same grounds as slave quarters. And for this reason, I say this is America. And I know that I have been called out to speak on this America and the injustices uh, that Black Americans have experienced and work with people to make it better. One thing I will say is that Americans need to begin seeing each other through a universal declaration of human rights lens. We need to be taught that in schools. American institutions need to be dismantled and rebuilt and Black Americans need to be at the forefront of these tables where laws and policies are being created and considered along with the intersections of our lives. And so that's, that's where I'm at. Thank you so much, London, and especially uh, sharing that very personal story. Thank you so much. Uh, Nikki, uh, we just have a couple of minutes before we get into our polls. So would you like to add a few brief comments before we go into our discussion? Is that, are you talking to me, Tessa? Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry, I didn't, I, you, you cut out for a second, so I didn't hear my name, sorry about that. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I just, I've, I've prepared a couple of remarks, and I'm gonna try and get through them as quickly um, as I can. I wanna start with that refrain, frequently caught on cell phone and body cameras, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. What I wonder about is the violence that is not caught on tape, violence that is second only to punches and kicks and gunshots, violence which is seen protesters groped and misgendered, folks often referred to as the least of these, folks without homes or supportive circles, folks who are never believed when they complain of being brutalized or raped and the violence that direct, that's directed towards them. Sexual violence is the kind of police violence that will never go viral or make headlines anywhere because it's rarely caught on tape. In addition to being a writer and performer, I'm also the Community Engagement Director for the Chicago Alliance Against Exploitation. Um, we're an organization that addresses the culture, institutions, and individuals that perpetrate, profit from, or support sexual harm. We provide pro bono legal services to survivors of sexual violence, as well as prevention, education, and public policy 
advocacy, including research. This is important because in the past year, we released a report on how Chicago enforces its prostitution laws against people who sell sex. Our research included interviews with women who are in the sex trade, some of them self-identified as trafficking victims. Each person who we interviewed said that they were harmed by police in some way from being verbally harassed or groped to being forced to provide sex to avoid arrest. I wanted to frame my remarks this evening through this particular lens because as I highlighted above, I first began writing about this particular form of police violence in 2014. That year, I had the unique opportunity of addressing the UN in Geneva about the history of sexual violence towards black women and girls in the US during the Universal Periodic Review that August of the Convention to End Racist Discrimination, also referred to as CERD. While there, I was able to witness testimony from the brother of Kia Boyd and the mother of Trayvon Martin, as well as the father of Jordan Davis and others who who'd had family members murdered by police. During that session in August 2014, it was Jordan Davis's father, Ron Davis, who announced on the UN floor that Mike Brown had been murdered. And when I came back that November for the UPR on the Convention Against Torture, Leslie McSpadden, Mike Brown's mother, joined the others that were there just a few months earlier to add her own testimony to the impact of police violence. I'm saying all of this because during the UPR for CAT, young members from We Charge Genocide and Black Youth Project 100, both groups are out of Chicago. They also testified about watching their friends get brutalized and murdered by police and the black sites that existed in Chicago at the time where when some folks um, who were taken to those black sites were arrested and they were taken without charges being filed. Um, so they made their testimonies, they were very powerful, and the U.S. Committee testified and basically refuted testimony from each one of us in civil society. Even, um, and so those young people um, decided to stand in silent protest on the U.N. floor. We all know that's a big no. <laughs> um, I stood with them, and even as the guards pressed closer, our passports were threatened with seizure and cameras from news outlets from all over the world interrupted the silence with the constant clicks of their shutters. All of that to say, as so many folks on this call have already said, black people have been ringing the alarm on police brutality for a long time, way before those moments in 2014, which was six long years ago. To that end, my suggestion for those of you who are aching to do something about this, who want nothing more than for folks to feel safe and protected by the police, um, who are paid to keep them safe and to protect them, I just wanna ask you to advocate for and with black people. I've done a lot of work facilitating things for survivors of sexual violence, and my practice is survivor-led, which means that my voice isn't the only one that matters. It means that survivors in the room can and do say what they need to in order to feel brave enough to tell their story, which means that I shut up and I listen. It means that I believe in the power of survivors to determine and dictate how they should be treated. I don't undermine or debate people's lived experiences, and I believe that this model is the way forward in this cultural moment. Okay. I'm a single mother raising a young black boy on the autism spectrum on the south side of Chicago. People looted right next to our house. That fire is a half a block away from us. And what I want is to be able to walk my son around the block in our neighborhood without fearing the residual effects of tear gas. But I want us to not live with this fear that is deep in my bones, that my son, once he hits puberty, he's six now, won't be brutalized by police because his autism makes it difficult uh, for him to both read social cues and follow orders. Finally, um, I just want people to understand that modern policing has taken decades to evolve from slave catching and that the remnants of such an ugly value system, which I believe is our nation's greatest shame, absolutely must be stamped out if we're to move forward. So to sum up, advocate for black people like you'd advocate for anyone who's been treated unfairly, who's been harmed and traumatized. Advocate for us who feel terrorized by our own country. Recognize that we have to work together and that we must co-power communities um, to rebuild systems that lift and protect all of our humanity this moment this is the moment that martin luther king jr described as the mountaintop so we can see now we can see that what has gone wrong and we can see what has gone deeply wrong and that now is the time for those of us to listen to those most affected those most brutalized and traumatized who we'd like to think of as the least of these but who i know and believe are the people who represent the best of what we have to offer we have to center what black people are saying and what black people are pushing and advocating for We've got to figure out and find out how to make this right. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You. Okay, now if this is the time we're going to have you as our or the audience and everyone that's on to participate. I'm going to turn it over to Farah. We have um, a, a poll that you'll be asked to participate on and then we'll have the discussion based on some of your responses. So Farah, can you give, a, um, give directions in terms of how to do the poll? 
Sure. If you are joining by uh, computer or laptop, um, you'll be able to participate in our three quick poll questions. Um, so I will uh, launch the poll. Um, and the first question is, um, have you personally experienced racism in your community, school, or workplace? Please pick one response. And we'll give it a few, few seconds until we get a majority to participate. Okay, a few more seconds. I see some last. All right. So um, unfortunately, you can see the results. 53% have indicated yes, 8% no, uh, even more striking as well as no, but a friend, coworker, or family member has. So we will um, go on to our next quick poll. Um, this is poll number two regarding police brutality. Have you or someone you know experienced police brutality or abuse? Give a few more seconds. All right. So this is a bit closer. 48% um, have indicated yes, and 52% have indicated no. Thank you for responding. And for our last poll, we will be discussing your personal feelings and current events. So um, this is multiple choice. In the past two weeks, how have you been feeling? And you have a list of options, including afraid, empowered, educated, sad, confused, hopeful, frustrated, empathetic. And please feel free to choose as many as applicable. few more seconds. Okay. And we'll be discussing uh, those responses uh, as we go through. Right. So 84% overwhelmingly indicated sad. Uh, the next two frustrated, empathetic, both at 76%. And uh, hopeful, 55%, and a close runner-up, 51% educated. So, Tita, I think this helps us to understand um, how the audience is feeling, and we can continue the conversation um, right now with open uh, comments um, and any type of um, opportunity for you to present. You can do so in the Q&A box if you would like to type it, and it could be read. Um, if you do have questions for any of the speakers, of course, please feel free to indicate it in the Q&A box. And then we will also um, be asking um, anyone if you would like to share to please raise your hand and we will unmute your mic. So we'll give um, a few minutes um, to check and we do have, Tita, um, some comments in the Q&A box. Okay, well, let's, let's go to Ginger Stillman first with this uh, Southern New York Division. Uh, Ginger? Did you unmute? Yes, we are unmuting Ginger. Ginger, you should be um, unmuted. Okay, now I am. Uh, I want to bring out that our Southern New York State Division came to the understanding that when we were looking at the Universal Periodic Review of Human Rights in 2014, one big human right was not included, and that had to do with criminal justice and uh, race. So we started there in 2014 in a series of events, 
that brought together a wide range of people and a wide range of issues having to do with all the uh, human rights that were being um, trampled upon by society at large. And you can read what I have written in the chat box. But we've had a series of about 10 consultations bringing together from people all across our region, trying to come up with um, recommendations that we should all follow, either with government or individually. Nations Association chapters in the past two weeks has been a culmination of, of everything that we have been discussing during that time. And we hope to move forward over this summer and uh, try real difference. Great. Either individually as United Nations chapters, et cetera. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much for that comment. Is there another comment, Farah? Yes, uh, Danielle Acton, um, you are unmuted. Okay, Danielle. Um, I think she uh, will work through her technical issues, um, but Michael Shannon has, um, you've been unmuted and you're allowed to speak. Michael? Okay, can you can hear me now? Yes, you have one minute. Okay, I really grateful to join the meeting today. And my uh, comment is uh, I try to work with the, with the uh, Secretary General about the reform, international law. And I see that the racism is really uh, got me because we try to work with the um, quality of life. We didn't. We have a low quality of life, and because the the rule law was outdated, and the reforms to be take care of that, and hopefully, with the secretary general will do a great reform. Which is, I have the idea that we need to get to live with the high class uh, society. We need to end the low class and middle class uh, society. And also the United Nations need to have the uh, trace to the farmer to build up, get all money and get more power. And also United Nations need to control the trace to the farmer of the world governments. So United Nations have more power uh good. Yeah. yeah that's good thank you so much for your comment regarding some actions that the un can take great okay, is there another comment Farah? yes uh aaron you are able to speak uh can you hear me madam yes uh first of all it is an honor of me to, as, a, as a join uh, to join everyone at through this little uh zoom uh, chat my comment is i just saw now that one of the officers in the floyd case it was just uh, free on bail and my question is how is it okay that we just say i mean obviously you can see one of them just there right there standing and next to mr floyd not doing anything and just watching i i, I asked myself how is that morally allowed as a police officer as a police officer for you to do something like that let alone for them to even let you free because you weren't the one putting your knee on on his neck, I, I find it very unfathomable that a law would even say it's okay for you to, it's okay for you because even though you were a bystander and you're not the one doing it, you get to go off free. Like, no. Right, right. Okay, thank you so much for your comment. And I'm sure that that's going to be getting a lot of discussion and, and uh, introspection as well as investigation. Okay, is there another question? Yes. Um... We have uh, Benedicta. Uh, yes, you've been unmuted. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I wanted to talk about, um, obviously, racism is not uh, just an American issue. It's a global pandemic, I can say. And um, how like it manifests itself in different ways in different countries. It might seem subtle, but I like to travel and I've been to different places. And uh, as a black young adult woman, everywhere I go, I face all sorts of racism, whether it's colorism or just people being mean because you have an accent or any other form of racism. Uh, but uh, racism, we can also recognize as a, a human rights issue. And compared to uh, poor children, malnutrition or child education or female rights, it's not something that the UN or the world has actually paid attention to as the human rights issues. Is there anything that the UN is doing about that or like specific legislation that could help with that? Thank you. Okay. As we get our, our next uh, speaker, with the, with the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals, it has uh, been more, much more inclusive and much more specific in terms of addressing some of the issues that you're talking about. So if you want to take a look at those, that would be wonderful. And then we do have uh, activities or programs that are not only in the U.S., but um, worldwide that um, the different organizations are doing through UNICEF as well as through uh, the UNA or through your local UNA chapters that may be addressing some of the specific uh, goals. But those 17 goals, 16 of them are very specific and do cover many of the things that you mentioned. Thank you. Uh, next question. Yes, uh, Cody, you are able to talk. Hey there. Um, so it's not necessarily a question, but it was kind of like a testimony. Um, I feel start, I feel as though uh, the role of the police is not necessarily to embrace equality. Um, I feel it should be more oriented oriented towards strengthening communities and being leaders with moral integrity and honor. Um, when I was 17, I got arrested. Uh, it's the only time I've ever been arrested. And it was for driving on a suspended license. I was riding with my grandmother and um, I was speeding because we were talking and um, I had to take a driver's test online and I waited till last minute to take the driver's test. And so I was riding home from work um, one day and I got pulled over and the police officer asked me if I was aware. And I said, I said no, and um, we ended up getting in. I was trying to explain to her that like I took a driver's test and when I took the driver's test online, it said that they would send it to the clerk of, uh, the, um, of you know, driving, I forget what it's called. But um, anyways, um, she ended up, um, she didn't talk to me as an equal. Um, she felt it was necessary to arrest me. And um, she actually lied in the um, arrest report saying that I knew that I was driving without a license, which I told her I didn't know it was expired. Okay, thank you for sharing that experience. Yes. Okay, another call? Yes, Phil. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great, great. This is Phil Cisneros, I live in California. And I just wanted to acknowledge this conversation and the conversation that United Nations Association is. And having these powerful conversations brings about what Victor Hugo said, an idea whose time has come. And ending racism is an idea whose time has come. Having human rights for all is an idea whose time has come. And it begins with conversation, speaking. It begins with listening. And that's what I see. The United Nations Association has the opportunity to have in our communities. And just even here is opening up that conversation that wasn't there a month ago. And now we're awake to it. We're alert to it. We're looking at what's next. And I just want to acknowledge that it's a very powerful place we're at for humanity and nowhere better than the United Nations Association to have this conversation. So thank you for having us. And, and thank you for your leadership uh, in your chapter there and for the statements that your chapter has issued. Great, okay, next call. Tita, Pamela has been unmuted. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just would like to talk to the 
uh, participants about mass incarceration. I, I think that's a very violent thing in itself uh, because this uh, violence is to um, power people into accepting this uh, whole system of mass incarceration. And I'd just like to hear some comments about that. Okay, London, would you want to uh, handle that one? Uh, the only thing I can say is it is a it is a very violent system. It is an unfair system. One of the concerns I know that uh, communities in Detroit, activists in Detroit have been doing is addressing uh, incarcerated people and the spread of the coronavirus. Um, and so what I can say is that it's going to take some time to, to rebuild the, the prison system. And that's going to take a lot of a lot of us on the ground and I'm, I'm very happy to know that there are organizations particularly in Detroit that are doing the work there are lawyers on the ground there are social workers it's just it we really do and one one of the ways that we can make that change is through continuing to exercise our power to vote to ensure that people that are in um, positions of leadership are ensuring that mass incarceration has comes to an end well, thank you, London. And uh, as generations link to each other uh, after the 67 riots and 68 riots, of course, um, Angela Davis has dedicated her life to dealing with incarceration. And she has several publications out. She's out of University of California. Uh, and of course, she's been in the middle of the civil rights movement uh, from the early 60s all the way through the present day. So there is there another call? We have time for two more uh, questions. Or comments. Stephen, you have been unmuted. Thank you. Um, I have, uh, I'm very grateful that, um, that there are people like you, um, Ms. Haskell Thompson, near Cuomo, but I'm really discouraged and depressed because even in a liberal state like New York, we aren't passing the stuff we need to be passing. Governor Cuomo, how do we get Governor Cuomo to sign the HALT bill that would take the first, even if an adequate step toward Limiting, limiting, limiting solitary confinement, something that the UN clearly states is torture. How is it possible if the governor of the state of New York is opposing a bill that would address no. racism, unfortunately no. affects people of color, that has enough votes in the Senate and the Assembly to pass? Similarly, he is not on board with the two parole reform act. We have 307 people from Westchester, where I live, who are serving life sentences in New York state jails. 240 of them are people of color. Why can't we at least give them the opportunity for parole? How do we proceed if even a state like New York and a, a liberal governor like Cuomo is not actively taking steps? And I know you can't change everything, but how do we as citizens enforce, compel him to address these evidences, continuing presence of, of racism that's going on in our name and in our silence? Uh, due to time, I'd like to take on this question because it's going to be a good segue into uh, Rachel's comments that are going to follow mine. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, your UNA chapters will be holding meetings, virtual meetings with state legislators as well as congressional and senatorial legislators. Uh, I would urge you to connect with uh, your UNA chapters, bring up the issues that you're talking about. So as we lay out uh, the agenda that your chapter may want to do in terms of human rights, um, issues specific to your particular areas, if there are those types of uh, specificities that are there, that would be a good time to discuss them and have them in your town hall meetings within your UNA chapters. And then uh, as you go into the, uh, the day of action, uh, where we are talking with our uh, lawmakers, um, form uh, position papers in terms of how that's going to go. So there are great opportunities we're offering this platform in terms of doing dialogues nationally, so we're connecting people, but we do want you also to uh, reach out and connect with your UNA chapters. Uh, they are doing uh, a lot of work in terms of advocacy, and uh, every, all of us have the same goal in mind. So thank you so much for participating in this relatively short dialogue, but it's a starter for us. Uh, but we thought it was necessary to do it at this time. The immediacy and the urgency of it called for that. 
And at this point, I'm going to turn you over to uh, Rachel Pittman, our Executive Director of UNA USA. Rachel? Thank you, Tita. Uh, and thank you, everyone. You know, as the leader of a grassroots organization, I often educate volunteers on the importance of storytelling as a mechanism to advocate for issues such as justice and equality. We must communicate our stories until we know we're heard, educating the misinformed, and breaking down barriers that divide us. So tonight, I want to thank everyone for sharing their personal stories and thoughts, and thank everyone who listened with empathy. Like many of you, I want to take action now so we can fight against racial injustice and we can make sure that our future upholds the principles of the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Therefore, I'd like to share with you the first steps you can take to respond to racism and inequality in America. Um, use, the first thing is use the UNA USA Racial Justice Resource Guide, which we just published. This resource includes uh, things like list of books and podcasts, articles, uh, racial, racial justice organizations and statements by UNA and the UN, all to help you mobilize, reflect, and hold meaningful conversations on police violence, human rights abuses, and racial oppression. Next, I'd like for you to text BLM to 738674 to tell your members of Congress to support a new resolution that calls for the creation of a U.S. Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Commission. This was introduced by Representative Barbara Lee. This resolution is an essential element in any process to address and ultimately extinguish racial injustice in this country and is reflective of principles and the processes advocated for by the UN since its founding. And also, I'd like for you next to consider joining UNA USA. We are proud as an organization to have over 20,000 members and more than 200 chapters throughout the United States, which provide opportunities for people to engage in civic action to address issues such as racial justice, global health, education, climate change, and gender equality, to engage and work towards the achievement of the UN's sustainable development goals. So join us by visiting unausa.org. I hope you all in closing have found a renewed purpose to be a part of the movement to end racism and inequality in America. And I wanna thank you all for your participation and I wish you all well. So have a good night. Thank you. Well to you, all keep well.